Good morning and welcome. We're glad you could make it to our online services today. Currently, we're not having services in person because there's just too much risk of sickness. Please pray that we'll be able to meet as a body soon and pray for the healing of the members of the church. Well, it's Christmas time again. Has everyone finished all their shopping? I hope so. I'm not very good at shopping. My wife is a pro. She's very efficient at it. Pastor Sandy also loves to decorate. This is the time of year when we start pulling out all the decorations, hanging the lights on the house, putting the wreath on the door. We get out the Christmas candles and all the other little knickknacks. And to top it off, we go out and get a Christmas tree. In our house, we usually have a big Christmas tree out in our living room area. One year, we tried to pull one over on our girls. We got one of those little abstract trees. Some people might call it a Charlie Brown tree. You know, the kind that doesn't need watering or leave pine needles everywhere. But that didn't go over so well. The girls were used to having their own tree with the fresh pine smell and the beautiful green branches. It's quite the occasion to get together with them and decorate it. We wrap the lights around the tree and hang up all the special ornaments. Sandy and the kids give me these little geeky Star Trek and Star Wars ornaments. I'm not sure if it's to have fun with me or not, but I love it. As a final step in decorating the tree, we put the final touch on it. We put the star on the top. The tree is the focal point of the holiday celebration. Why do we put up a tree? What does it remind us of? Well, I can tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the cross. The cross wasn't the same shape as the Christmas tree. It wasn't decorated like a Christmas tree, but it came from a tree. The cross was where Jesus died for you and me. He didn't go to the cross for his own crimes. He didn't go to the cross for his own sins. Hebrews 4.15 says that he was in all points tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. He was the spotless lamb. The cross was not meant for Jesus. It was meant for Barabbas. Barabbas was a criminal. Like Barabbas, we too are guilty of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus went to the cross as a substitute for Barabbas. He went to the cross as a substitute for you and me. The cross upon which Jesus died, of course, is nothing like the Christmas tree that I'm used to, but it's never less a tree. There are several references in the New Testament that use the tree in place of the cross. If you're curious, you can look them up in your concordance. There's one reference in particular that I'd like to share with you today. It's in 1 Peter, 2 verses 21 through 25. Verse 21 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. What Peter is saying here is that God called you to do good. He's called you to do good even if it means suffering. Why? Because Christ suffered for you. He's our example. And the Bible tells us that we should follow his steps. Verse 22 continues, who, being Jesus, committed no sin, 
nor was deceit found in his mouth. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He didn't deserve the cross, but he accepted it willingly. Why? Because he loves you. He loves me. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He wants you to spend eternity with him, not in separation from the Father, or the Son, or the Spirit, we were lost. We were separated before Jesus went to the cross for us. Continuing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Who, again Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who is he talking about here? Pilate? The Sanhedrin? He did not retaliate when he was insulted. How many can say that they've never retaliated? He never threatened revenge when he suffered. This is contrary to human nature. It goes against what our flesh tells us to do. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He had flesh just like us. He was tempted just like us. But instead of allowing his flesh to control him, he left his case in the hands of God. He knew that the victory was already his. He knew God would judge fairly and righteously do you know any situations like that today? Corruption in our legal system? It's nothing new. Look at what happened to Jesus, a completely innocent man. And more than that, a completely sinless man. One who was innocent by both man's standards and God's standards, was crucified. No, the cross wasn't fair, but it was the only way that we could be reconciled to God. An innocent man had to die in our place so that lasting righteousness could be restored. This is something that we could never do on our own. It's God's perfect plan of salvation. Listen to this in 1 Peter 2.24. It says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. He personally carried our sins in his body. He personally took them onto the cross. Why did he do such a wonderful thing for us? So that we could be dead to sin. That was our body up on the cross. That was our flesh up on that tree. Jesus took it and put it to death so that we could live unto righteousness. Without the cross, we would not be dead to our sins. Without the cross, we can't live a righteous life. No matter how hard we try, we could go to church every day of the week and still not live a righteous life in God's eyes. There's only one way to live a righteous life in God's eyes. Believe in Jesus and the work he did on the cross for you. Tell him that you're sorry for your sins. Invite him into your heart and make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Become dead to your sin and live unto righteousness. And what is the result of faith in Jesus and living unto righteousness? 
Why has Jesus done such a marvelous thing for us? I'll tell you why. Healing. Reconciliation. Restoration. The Bible says that by his wounds you were healed. Hallelujah. That is what the tree means to me. Righteousness. Not my own righteousness, but the righteousness of the Son of the living God. The righteousness of Jesus. Praise God. The tree that was meant for unrighteousness has become the tree of righteousness. The tree that was meant for death has become a tree of life, a tree of healing, a tree of glory, a tree of abundance. Hallelujah. Can anyone say amen to that? So what does the Christmas tree mean to me? In the Christmas tree, I see the cross. On one side, I see pain, suffering, and death. On the other side, I see forgiveness, power, and resurrection. Look at what the Lord has done. On one side, I see ashes. But on the other side, I see beauty. Praise the name of Jesus. On one side, I see myself, my flesh, the old man. On the other side, I see a new creation. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath foreordained, that we should walk in them. I see the lights on the tree. Those lights are us, believers, strung all around the world to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost, even if it means suffering. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I see the ornaments on the tree. Those beautiful ornaments are like beautiful, good works in Jesus. The ornaments are the type of works that will remain and will withstand the fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The presents under the tree are the gifts of the Spirit given to us so that the church can have an abundant, rich, spirit-filled life. Luke 11.13 says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Isn't that tremendous? The gifts of the Spirit are talked about in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 12. I'd like to read through them with you now. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. In other words, there are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. 
There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. In other words, to one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. Verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability for prophecy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, and another is giving the ability to interpret what is being said. But all these worketh, that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, it's the one and the only Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Hallelujah. These gifts, they bind us together. The final part of the Christmas tree is the star, the light of Israel, the light of the world, and the head of of the church and the body of Christ. Numbers 24, 17 says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The star sits atop the tree. What a beautiful picture that I see in that tree. How beautiful a thing my Lord has done for me. Aren't you thankful for what Christ has done? When you see the Christmas tree this year, remember the birth of Christ and the gift that was given to all of us through him. Remember also the perfect Christmas tree, the cross. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the people that have been able to listen to this message. I hope that, Lord, you've spoken to them through it. Lord, I pray for our congregation. Lord, I pray for our congregation. I pray you would heal all of the members that are sick in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to be able to meet soon in person again. We thank you for what you're going to do, Lord Jesus. We pray to the Father through Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you now. Bye-bye.